And now back for a closer look at the tangled state of Labor's government in New South Wales. There's no doubt, even with a bunch of new faces, including the Premier, Nathan Rees, that if New South Wales voters had the chance to express their feelings about the government any time soon, it would be a bloodbath. Even with two years of the statutory four-year term left to run, some le uh, senior Labor strategists behind the scenes still think the Rees government will prove to be terminal. It doesn't help the credibility of the revamped government that disaffected outgoing Treasurer Michael Costa has dumped on the state of the budget. The new Labor team was all smiles today, but how do they stop the rot? Deborah Cornwall reports. I didn't expect it to be the uh, seismic event that it turned out to be. Uh, who could predict such a, an earthquake in New South Wales politics? And I certainly didn't. In the last four days, we have seen not only the emasculation of a Premier and history made with the, with the first New South Wales Labor Premier to be dumped by their caucus. Um, we've also seen the emasculation of the all-powerful right wing of the Labor Party in New South Wales. They're now laughing stock. Uh, in the rest of the country. After days of bloodletting and headlopping by the New South Wales Government, today's swearing in of its freshly minted ministry seemed remarkably civilised. You know, I've given my mum a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> she just described you as a delight but dodgy when you were a teenager, Premier. <laughs> Go on, Mum. The unprecedented factional war all started gently enough last Wednesday with the surprise resignation of the Deputy Premier, John Watkins. Now the time has come for me to change. Within 48 hours, the government had virtually imploded, starting with the sacking of the deeply unpopular treasurer, Michael Costa, who at first simply refused to go, and then dropped the bombshell that the New South Wales economy was on the verge of collapse. The only job I'm interested in is, um, is the Treasurer's job. I'm interested in doing the mini-budget, but I am not prepared for political expediency to present a mini-budget that I know will threaten the AAA credit rating. It's a disturbing and indulgent press conference, uh, and Morris never deserved that from the Treasurer that he, that Morris had supported so strongly for so long. Going to caucus to provide a report. Do you think you'll still be Premier at the end of the meeting? By the end of the meeting, the Premier was out of a job as well, stabbed in the back by the warlords of his own faction, the New South Wales right. Did you have anything to do with his resignation at all? Do I take that smile as maybe, or...? And by lunchtime, the state had a brand new Premier. That's the intention, Harold. I will be giving you the effort you deserve. I will be having a red-hot go at fixing the problems in New South Wales and giving you the services and the standard of services that you as taxpayers are entitled to. The extraordinary fallout has been a long time in the making, dating back to the State Party conference in May when Morris Yemmer and Michael Costa openly defied delegates by refusing to back down on their proposed sale of the state's electricity generators. What I've got to say to you here today is there's dishonesty after dishonesty in this debate. Dishonesty after dishonesty. The Yemmer government has also been plagued by scandal. From the disgraced former Aboriginal Affairs Minister Milton Orkopoulos, who was jailed for child sex charges, to a series of spectacular breakdowns in services, from public transport to hospitals. The polls have been dire. Mr Yemmer's personal satisfaction ratings and the primary vote for the Labor Party have been about as low as the history of news poll records those numbers as being. And this certainly hastened Mr Yemmer's demise. The new Premier, a straight-talking former backroom boy, has wasted no time in marking out his turf. By yesterday, he had claimed three more scalps and promised an increasingly weary electorate that this time things would be different. This is our last chance. The caucus knows that. And uh, from today, it's game on. Back to work. Uh, the soap opera is over. Anyone that, that suggests Nathan Rees is not his own man is crazy. This guy uh, has been thinking about politics and leadership for a long time. He's very clever. He's rough around the edges because of where he's come from. And that's endearing, I think. But despite the new Premier's assurances he will not be controlled by the party machine at Sussex Street, 
factional heavyweights like Joe Tripodi and Eric Rusendahl have remained in the new cabinet, alongside a whole new team of fresh-faced nobodies. The difficulty in finding a, a, a talented cabinet at this stage is primarily that the government's so old. After 13 years, it has moved through its uh, pool of available, available human resources. We've lost the five most senior people in New South Wales politics. That's why this is a political earthquake. I mean, all in one go, they're gone. It's not an auspicious start when your new ministerial team is being tagged the C team, is it? Uh, look, I think that's nonsense. I think it's an A team. The boys are back in town, the factions are in charge, and nothing's changed. This is a Mor Nathan Rees promised change, and yet what he's delivered is more of the same. The deep alarm inside the party is that no leader, no matter how talented, can turn around a government that's simply run out of puff and now has the worst performing economy in the country. Well, I think our new Premier summed it up. He said, well, we're not broke, but it's pretty bad. There are enormous challenges. Um, are they up to it? Uh, you know, that remains to be seen. Enormous challenges, slight understatement. Deborah Cornwall with that report. To check again on any of tonight's stories or interviews,